Greetings students and happy chapter number 26 or epilogue chapter for human development. We're gonna talk about this last stage which is really death and dying. How do we process death? How do we deal with grief and loss, losing loved ones? And how, as we get older, how do we deal with the fact that death will be coming soon? All right, so let's look at some things that have really changed over the last century or 100 years. Remember earlier in our time together, we discussed that back in 1900, the average life expectancy was 47. We died from disease. Here we are in 2019 and our life expectancy is a lot longer. So death occurs later. However, we could be living longer with chronic disease because our medical advancements have allowed us maybe not to die, but there's nothing to really cure some of our chronic conditions. So death takes longer. Right? Where we're dying has really changed. Uh, when we're dying has changed and how we're dying. So all these things have changed, which means death is a lot less familiar than it was 100 years ago. It looks a lot different. And the term thanatology refers to the study of death and dying. We really see that every different religion and every different, maybe even culture, have their own practices, rituals that they do in relation to death. So whether it's um, performing certain ceremonies or whether it's having certain prayers recited, whatever it is, there's always these kind of customs that follow the death process. When it comes to how we as adults deal with or accept death, it's very different from how children process death because their perspective is very different. Remember, their brain is not fully developed yet, unlike you and I. And so the perspective is a little different. Um, some children just, you know, they really won't understand. So if you say something like, you know, grandma's gone. Well, where did grandma go? Is she coming back? And you say, well, no, honey, grandma's like, she's, she's died. She's gone on. Uh, maybe if you believe in heaven, she's, she's gone on to heaven. You know, your child will say, okay. And then the next day they'll say, when is grandma coming to visit? Do you remember, honey, we had this conversation. We talked about how grandma's not going to come visit anymore. She's gone. Then they'll start to sob and cry uncontrollably. And the next day they'll be back to, where's grandma at? They don't really understand the finality of death, that it means no more. And so it takes them a little more time to process, right? It's a little different um, than you and I who understand that meaning and that fatality, that finality. If we look at this picture here in the slide, what you see is a um, Central American country that is really coming together to support a family that has lost a child. And you can see the casket here is white because the white really symbolizes sinlessness. It symbolizes that a child is viewed as being sinless, that they're too young to have committed sin. Therefore, this child is going to heaven. This child is kind of like an angel, if you will. Right, our young people, by young people, I mean adolescents, teenagers, remember how they still do that kind of risk and rewards, right? They still do dumb things. Right. They drink and drive and do drugs and speed down the freeway at 120 miles an hour because they don't really fear death. They just believe it can't happen to me. Not going to happen, right? This is fascinating. So let's look at how we're dying, the causes of death, how they're different from 1900 to 2000, right? So early 20th century means 1900. Early 21st century means 2000. So 100 years apart. Back in 1900, 85% of us died from disease. So typhoid was a killer. We died from disease. We did not have penicillin. We did not have the antibiotics we have today. And so we died from disease. 12% died from accidents. 1% homicide and 2% suicide. Now let's fast forward, jump forward 100 years to 2000, which was almost 20 years ago. 2000, 
our disease goes from 85% of us dying from disease to 28%. That's a huge decrease in the percentage of us that are dying because of disease, and that's all due to our medical advancements, right? However, look at some of the other things. So our accidents go from 12% in 1900 to 41% today. And the majority of the accidents are motor vehicle accidents. Car accidents, that's what they are. Homicide goes from 1% 100 years ago to 15% of people being murdered are being killed because they're being murdered. Suicide goes from 2% to 16%. We know the majority of that number is our, our young people and our, our elders, our senior citizens. Those are the two groups that really battle with depression and um, suicide in general. And so it kind of makes you wonder, what is it gonna look like in 80 years from now when we get to 2100, right? What is death going to look like? But some huge changes in just 100 years. All right, so as we get older, so we're 65, we're 75, we're 85, as we get older in life, what happens is, the anxiety around dying really decreases and we become much more hopeful. For instance, when I first maybe mentioned to you or you read the syllabus for this class and thought, I'm gonna have to write a paper about my funeral? I'm only 21. That seems really creepy, really morbid, yick, right? Because you thought, as a young people, we don't wanna think about death. None of us want to think, oh my goodness, I could die tomorrow. We don't think that way, and it's kind of scary to think like that. However, when you get to be 85, you think about death a lot more because it's around the corner. You accept that at this stage in life, death is much closer than it was when I was 21. And so we think about it, and we become less anxious about it because we've lived our life, and we become more hopeful in the sense of, you know, I have children, or grandchildren, I have contributed to my profession, and I feel hopeful about the next generation and the future that my grandchildren will have. So it looks, death looks a little bit different for us as we get older. And thinking on your funeral papers and how you portrayed your celebration of life or whatever you called it, you know, there's some differences here. On the left hand side, we're looking at a memorial or a funeral service for a Chris Cross, because Chris Kelly, who was a member of a rap duo called Chris Cross, and he died young. And in this funeral, we see kind of the traditional casket, and we see a lot of maybe faith-based worship, praise with the singers. And then on the right-hand side, we see Paul Salucci, who was the governor of Massachusetts, and he served in our armed forces. And so here we see the casket draped in that American flag, and we can see the patriotism. We can see that tradition and that honor in this funeral, right? And so that's what we're saying is that there's really no rights and wrongs in how you want to have your celebration or funeral service at the end of life. It speaks to your values. It speaks to what is important to me. Is my faith-based, you know, is that important to me? Is it that I want to have family members speak about me? What is it? Or is it that I don't want any money or expenses spent on me? I want to have something very um, non-traditional. Is it that I want to donate my body to science? Um, I want to contribute up until the end. Like, whatever it is, is really just you figuring that out about you. All right, so let's talk about the difference between a good death and a bad death. So a good death really has six different things going on here. Number one is it's peaceful. Right? It's not surrounded by chaos and all of those different kinds of things. It's a peaceful passing. It's quick. We're not living in pain and agony for long periods of time. We want a quick and painless death. None of us think to ourselves, I want to suffer. We don't want to suffer. It occurs after a long life. In other words, we think about dying at 95, 100. We don't want to think about dying at 25. It's in the company of family and friends. So think about being surrounded by your loved ones. You're, you're kind of doing this passing on. I've been in a room where they've had that kind of passing of the baton um, at the time of death. And it can be really beautiful um, if you're surrounded by our loved ones. 
and you're in familiar surroundings. So in other words, you're in your home or your daughter's home. You know, we really don't want to go into the hospital in the sterile setting to die in these unfamiliar surroundings. And a bad death is really the opposite of all of those things. It's really being alone. So not in the company of our loved ones. We didn't, we, we feel lonely at that time of death. We feel like we didn't invest in relationships, whether those be romantic or friendship based. And, and none of us want to die alone. We all want to feel that we mattered, that we were worth something. And we don't want to think that I meant I really did nothing and I meant nothing and, and I'm all alone. No one's even going to care if I'm gone. That's not how we want to go. Right? All right, if you ever took psychology, you probably heard of a psychologist, Kubler-Ross. And Kubler-Ross has come up with these five different stages that we go through when we grieve, when we lose someone and we're going through this grieving process, right? The first stage is denial. So if you get the cancer diagnosis, stage four, or your mom gets the cancer diagnosis, stage four, first thing is, can't be true. We're going to get a second opinion and a third opinion and a fourth opinion and a fifth opinion because I'm only 38 and there's no way I'm dying. So we're in denial for some time. And then as we go through that denial process, we end up being angry. Right? And this can last for a long time, but people get angry. They get angry at the doctor. Did you miss that diagnosis? They get angry at maybe even the loved one, maybe even their, their loved one that has a cancer diagnosis. Mom, did you not go for that mammogram? Did you not get screened for breast cancer? Huh? Did you not? Did we get angry at them? We may get angry at God or whatever you believe in, but we get angry because we are out of control. We can't stop what's going to happen to our loved one, and that anger and that emotion needs to be directed somewhere. So we can expect this. And then we go into this bargaining stage where we start to say, okay, that anger is gone. Now I want to figure out what I can do. How can I manage this? How can I control it? And so I will bargain with God or whatever you believe, but you will start to say, I will do this if you will do that. So, um, you know, I lost my only sibling, my only brother at the age of 28 to AIDS. And it was a just, I can't even describe it, right? It was a horrible, horrible experience and painful. But I remember being in the hospital room with my brother, bargaining with God. I would say, I'm not even, I don't have kids, but you know what? I'll give you my firstborn child. I will be a missionary to Papua New Guinea, wherever you want to send me, if you will save my brother. We bargain because we feel out of control and we want to do something to change the situation. It's very normal to go through that. After bargaining, we kind of go into this place where we realize it's not gonna work and we go into depression. And this is where you may be in bed and just don't wanna get out of bed. You pull the covers over your head and you're not moving and you just don't wanna to go to work. You don't wanna do anything. You don't wanna to talk to anyone. You're in depression because this has happened or happening to your loved one. <clears throat> and finally, excuse me, we get to this final stage of acceptance where we realize that me or my loved one is going to die and there's nothing I can do to change that. And I need to learn to accept it and figure out how to go on without them. And this is tough because this can, you know, last for some time and we can be in one of these stages longer than others. Um, students will often ask me things like, so I have a friend who just lost her mother. I don't know what to say to her. Like, I'm, I'm afraid if I go up to her and say to her, oh, I'm so sorry, you lost your mom. She, it's gonna make her cry and she's gonna be all upset and I don't wanna reopen that wound. And so it's awkward, I don't know what to say. Really what I would say is what you can really do for your friends and family that are going through grief and loss is to go and tell them, I am here for you for whatever you need because that's all we want to hear at that time. In other words, if you wake up at two in the morning and you're crying uncontrollably, call me. I'll come over and hold you, or you can cry on the phone with me. If you are depressed and in bed and can't get up, call me. I'll, t I'll drop the kids at school. 
I'll bring you some food for dinner so you don't have to cook. I will be there. I will be the person that supports you through this difficult time of going through these stages, right? If you need to cuss someone out, call me. If you're angry, call me, right? That's what we need to tell each other. And I even think that going beyond that, something that we can do to support people who go through loss is to remember that after some time, they need you more. In other words, when I hear someone's lost a loved one, I typically wait until about a month, two weeks to a month after the funeral to reach out to them. Because what happens is when you lose your loved one, everybody's there for you. Every, people are dropping off food and people are volunteering to do things for you for about a week, if that. And then after that, they go on with their lives. And you are left to figure out how do I go on with my life without my loved one? And it becomes a really quiet time. It's a time that is very sad. And so I typically wait to send a card or to call people until two weeks to a month after because I know that at that time, not many people are around for them. And they need to know, you know what, I know you're going through a quiet time. You're going through hurt and I'm here for you, right? Um, and I would also say to be careful with your words. So if you have this friend who lost her mother, you don't want to go up to her and say, you know, I, I understand what you're going through. Because your friend might turn around and say, what do you mean you understand what I'm going through? Your mother's standing right there. You don't know what I'm going through. And your friend has every right to say that because she's hurt and angry and feeling all these emotions. And so you can't say that unless you've lost your mother. I may be able to comfort someone who's lost a brother or a sister, but I have my mother. So I can't really understand what someone who's lost their parent goes through. I can't. I can just tell them I will be here for you, whatever you need, I'm here. But I really shouldn't say I understand because I don't. So be careful with your words. All right. You know, Maslow is going to talk about that as we come to this age, we, um, we can, you know, talk, we'll talk a little bit here about this end of life stage and hospice care. And hospice is kind of a whole new world of nursing. So when does death occur? So we talked about how we die, the causes of death. Now let's talk about where are we dying? Like where, where does it happen at? It's kind of interesting. This pie chart is pretty equal. The blue refers to 29% of us dying in a hospital. You go to the hospital because you're having a heart attack and you die in the hospital. This makes sense, right? The lavender section says 27% of us are dying at home. And that has to do with hospice care. That has to do what we'll talk about in a minute, which is that the movement now is to allow those who are terminally ill or who will be dying soon to not have to die in a hospital, but to die in familiar surroundings. The green kind of celery color refers to 21% of us dying in nursing homes. This makes sense because our oldest population is in nursing homes and a lot of them are frail or very ill. And then that marigold kind of yellow color says 23% of us die in an other category. And the other category really refers to a car accident, a drowning accident, and you died in the swimming pool, you died on the road, you died somewhere other that really we didn't think or plan on, right? All right, so when does death occur? Death occurs, you know, it's, it's really changed our definition of when death occurs. But what we say is that evidence of death is when the brain has no more higher functioning. So at brain death, when there is no more electrical activity, when your neurons are not firing off anymore, we can keep your organs working. We can hook you up to machines that make your lungs go up and down and we can feed you intravenously and we can do all that. But if you have no longer have the functioning of your brain cells, of your neurons, you're never going to be able to function independently. You're never going to be able to make your body work on your own. And so that's really what we call, you know, death. The time of death is at that brain death. 
right? Passive euthanasia versus active euthanasia. So, you know, euthanasia basically means this assistance at end of life or, or towards death. And there's a difference between active and passive. Passive euthanasia really means that we allow for a natural death to occur. So in other words, when a patient has a DNR order, DNR stands for do not resuscitate. When a patient has that order, it really just means that if they have a heart attack, as medical professionals, we are not allowed to administer CPR. You will let the heart stop. And that is a D DNR order. And for terminal patients or patients that are very sick, they would establish a DNR order ahead of time because they know that if you revive me from my heart attack, I will still be suffering or I will die because I'm terminal. And so a DNR is an example of really passive euthanasia. It allows for a natural death. Active euthanasia is different because active euthanasia means I am assisting death. I am actually giving you um, some pills. I'm actually doing something that will cause you to die earlier, sooner than your body would naturally go. Some of the concerns with that is going to be our physician-assisted suicide. So this is when a doctor is going to help a patient to end their life. The doctor is going to administer an overdose of morphine or whatever it be. And this is controversial, right? Um, you can see here in the U.S., there's only a limited number of states that allow, it is legal, to have physician-assisted suicide. Right? Because it is kind of a slippery slope on when do we determine that you are sick enough that we will help you end your life. That's kind of a gray area. Right, before we get to this, let me go back because I think I missed our conversation on hospice care. Yeah. So I want to talk about hospice care because this is a huge new field of nursing. It's not new, but it's going to continue to grow as far as an expanding field of nursing. And that is hospice. So what does hospice do? Hospice provides what we call palliative care. And palliative care is pain management. In other words, hospice is when terminally ill patients leave the hospital or leave a medical facility and they go home to die. So they go to maybe their own home, it could be a, a child's home, a daughter or son's home, and the family members agree to take care of their loved one. So, you know, in hospice, you may have a nurse, an RN, come visit the patient once a week. And the nurse will come in and they will take vitals and, and they will talk with the family and <coughs> administer or alter any medication that's needed. And then during the week, the family members are the ones who are really providing the hands-on care. I mentioned my grandmother was 102 when she passed away, and we, we really enjoyed all of our time with her. And at her end of life, she moved in with my aunt, and my aunt took care of her in hospice care. And so what would happen is when my aunt had a question, she would call the nurse and say, you know, my mom's feet are swollen. What should I do? And the nurse would just tell her how to manage that situation right? Um, and she would take care of it. But the goal here was to put the patient on pain medicine and allow them to die a natural death. That's our goal here. Therefore, the family should be on board that mom or dad or our loved one is going to die. Right? Now, I have a couple students in Sac State in the gerontology department who um, worked in hospice. One did a Kaiser hospice and the other did uh, Mercy hospice. And they did their internships there. And, you know, they did different activities with the um, terminal patients. One of them absolutely loved it. She felt like this is a calling for her. She really enjoyed what she did. The other one said, no, this is not for me because she couldn't stop crying. She cried and she cried every time she lost one of her patients. And this is the one field that you as a healthcare practitioner, as a nurse or whatever you be, you are guaranteed to lose 100% of your patients. They are terminal, they will all die. So your goal is not to try any extraordinary measures, your goal is to help them transition in a respectful and honorable 
manner with as little pain as possible into the stage of death. And so for some people, you, that's just too painful and they don't want to do something like hospice nursing, right? But it is a huge field. You are such a tremendous help to the family who is going through this process. What happens is your loved one eventually dies at home and you call 911 and you have a ambulance come and, and take them away. But for the patients, the patients are able to die surrounded by family and friends at home or in a familiar surrounding. So it's very beneficial. I will say that in order to be eligible for hospice, you must be six months from death's door. So in other words, if your mom or, or grandma gets a diagnosis of cancer, but the doctor says she has 18 months, they can't go into hospice until they're closer to six months. Okay? All right, I wanted to follow up on that because that's a big thing. Okay, still talking about end of life decisions. And one of the things that is really possibly useful to you is what we call a living will. So most of us are familiar with the will. A will is when you die, if you filled out or completed a will, it says who gets what of your stuff. So for instance, when my grandma passed away, actually years before my grandma passed away, she had been talking to all of us kids and grandkids and we would go, she would bring us through the house and she would say, what do you want? And what she did is she put stickers on the bottom of all of her different knickknacks and different mementos and treasures with our names on them for what we kind of claimed, if you will. She was able to talk about this because, I mean, goodness, she's 98 years old. She knows she's going to die. And she wanted us to have a say-so in the items that were important to us. Right? I mean, I love all the things I got. But so that's hopefully what you, ha you have done or you will do in the future. Because what happens is if you don't have a will, your house and your belongings go into probate. And what that means is, you know, it's kind of like just the government or the city or whatever you call it has to get involved in divvying up your belongings. So would you rather determine who gets your money, who gets your house? My grandma had five kids and she split the, the house, money from the house five ways, you know? That's what she did, right? Um, so how do you want that to happen? A living will is different because a living will is for when you're still alive. It's before you die. Now let's say that I am in a car accident and I am in a coma. So I can't speak for myself. My living will would tell the doctors what I want them to do. So my living will might say um, something like, you know, if there is a risky surgery that has 10% survival rate, I don't want it, or I do want it. It would specify, if I'm in a comatose state, I, I want you to go ahead and, and disconnect all of the machines. I don't want to live that way, right? Um, so a living will says what you want to happen. This is important because if you don't have a living will, what happens is your next of kin or um, your partner or spouse will make those decisions. So if you're married, your wife or husband will make those decisions. Um, if not, it would be your mother or sister or closest family member who hopefully you like, number one, <laughs> or you've talked to them about what you desire. So that's a living will. You can look online and you can actually get some formatting to do a living will. All right, so the grief process, let's talk about this. Bereavement. Bereavement is just after I lose a loved one, it's this feeling that something is gone. It's this loss. My life has changed, and that is this bereavement, this feeling of sense of loss. Grief is actually, gosh, grief is powerful. Powerful. It's a powerful emotion that can overwhelm you. It can, you can cry nonstop for weeks on end, or you can just be in depression for a very long time. Remember, I went to one funeral of an older couple, and the man had lost his wife, and he had been married to her for 67 years. Right? He was in his 80s. And when it was time, she was in a traditional casket. And when it was time to lower that casket into the ground, he actually threw himself on that casket. And they're like lowering the casket with him on it. He was overcome with grief. 
he could not fathom living his days out without somebody he had been married to for that long. And that's grief. It can make you do crazy things because it's overwhelming. <laughs> and then when we talk about mourning, mourning refers to our rituals and customs and traditions that we will do after losing a loved one. So in your paper number three, I should see a lot of your of mourning, right? What ceremonies are you going to do? What traditions are, are you going to have, right? If any. We talked before about, um, you know, placing blame, right? We talked about how we're angry and want to place blame. However, when it comes to children dying, this is a situation in which most of us would agree there's no explanation. There's no reasoning. Why does a five-year-old get leukemia? It's not fair. It's just not fair. Um, I have a cousin, and my cousin had a five-year-old daughter who got leukemia. Um, and I remember going to visit her in Children's Hospital, and she would go through chemo, and she would have bits of hair and a lot of hair missing. And, and it was such a horrible experience. And I remember thinking, I didn't have children at the time. And I remember thinking, I don't know that I could go through this as a parent because it's not fair. You get angry and think it's not fair. It's just difficult to go through loss. What we know from research is that most couples struggle to survive, to stay together in marriage after the loss of a child. And the reason is because, a couple reasons. Number one is that it's unnatural to lose your child. In other words, I expect my children to bury me. I expect that. I expect I'm going to die before my children do and they will bury me. I don't expect to bury my children. I don't expect to outlive them and I don't want to. This is one of the things I don't want to ever experience. And so it's unnatural. But the next thing is that most couples grieve differently. I had one couple I talked to that lost their 16 year old son on a motorcycle accident and the mother always wanted to talk about him and remember him and talk about stories to her friends and family. And the husband couldn't do it. He, he would leave the room if his son's name came up because for him, it was too painful. It was too painful to hear him, hear his name, to think about it. And so what happens is this couple is grieving differently. And for that reason, a lot of marriages are going to struggle to survive the loss of a child. My cousin that lost her five-year-old um, daughter, they had two other children, her and her husband. They got divorced, it was about two years after. Two years after they lost their, Michaela, their daughter, they, they got divorced. I mean, it's just a difficult thing to go through. Fortunately for my parents who lost their only son, um, they went to counseling. So they went to therapy where there was other couples, other parents, who have lost children, and they were able to talk about their feelings and their emotions. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why they've been married for 55 years now, is because they sought help, because you need help to get through this kind of pain. All right, so even though a lot of us react differently to loss and death, around six months to a year, you know, life goes on. It's not that we're happy, happy again, but we may have other children. We may have, you know, responsibilities that we have to kind of go through that grieving process and get back to life. All right, so that's it. Make sure to go through your clicker slides to, to assure you have an understanding of our learning material about death and dying. Um, it's been a good conversation for 26 chapters, learning about this human development process and kind of seeing it still continues throughout late life. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you and teaching you, and I hope you've enjoyed our time together.